We also have plenty of other surprises on today's show. So let's get started. Here's your host, Brandy England. Hello, 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 everyone. I am excited to be here with you on this beautiful, sunny day. I don't know where you are in the world, but I hope your heart is full of sunshine as well, if it's not outside. Um, I'm really excited because Cass, one of my regular co-hosts, has invited uh, a man who's quite funny. He's an actor, a director, an influencer, a comedian, a photographer from New Zealand. And I've just learned a Photoshop guru, um, and I've really enjoyed checking out everything about him and learning about his uh, creative website and Facebook group. And so I'm really excited to hear his story. Uh, he's explored the world through art and film. He's sharing bits that he finds beautiful and trying to spread love and compassion along the way. Uh, he's also making a series of daily blogs from lockdown while New Zealand isolates during the pandemic that we're all going through right now. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Cass very shortly because there are friends going way back. But before I disappear into the background to listen to the great story, I noticed somewhere on Jordan's page that he wrote, if it costs you your inner peace, it's too expensive. And I just love that. Jordan uh, Jordan Rivers is our guest today, everyone. And I love that, <laughs> that quote. I think it's amazing. Can you just, before I let Cass take it away, can you just tell me what that quote means to you? Because I think it's perfect. Uh, well, thank you for that intro, by the way. You've really, really talked me up there. No pressure. Um, <laughs> for me, I, for me, that's just a good th thing to rule by. I, th I think if anything costs you your inner peace, then it's, it's definitely too expensive. And for me, it's just a, a thing that I like to focus on so that we don't get so swept up with this whole ah, focus on our idea, our current idea of what is productive and earning money and that, you know, that horrible cycle of just being a cog in a machine, you know, mm. if that's not too yeah. hippie. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is such a great time to reflect on that too. So I just want to make sure that you make sure you plug your uh, social media because you are so much fun. I learned so much going through <laughs> your pages and I laughed so much going through your pages and I was inspired. So please make sure at some point to plug all of your social media so people out there can learn and laugh as much as I did. And Cass, take it away. Thank you, Brandy. You <laughs> stole my <laughs> intro out from under me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, much hype. That's the best hype I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Brandy's good at that. Brandy, Brandy is just a professional hype person. Um, I think I probably need a smaller app version of Brandy just every morning to have a listen to before I start my day. <laughs> It'd be great. I've often had the same thought. Um Hello, Jordan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, oh, thanks for inviting me. This is very, yeah. very cool. Very cool thing to do. Let's quickly talk about um, how you know how we know each other. What our our history is as um, you know friends, and and then um, how that ties into our respective and especially your creative histories. Yeah, um, sure. Thing. It'd be so embarrassing if I get this wrong. We we met we did we met in a drama class, didn't we? Was that where we? Were? Yeah, we we did the <laughs> oh, same. God, okay, cool. Yeah, we did the same drama class um, after school when we were about uh, fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, for the longest time, I thought that you must go to my school because you were friends with the other people in the class who went to my school. Um, no. <laughs> and it, it turned out that, no, you went to a completely different college. And I, I suddenly felt so much better for not having noticed you around school because in actual fact, <laughs> you had never been there. You no, know, I think that was um, a common thing. I don't know what happened there, but I, I, I joined this drama group that you were a part of. And I think everyone was just so welcoming and, and so inviting and everything. I was kind of absorbed into this community. And then... And then suddenly I started getting added to your high school groups and I was invited to prom at one point and the drama teacher invited me to come do some things at the school with the students. And I was like, you guys know I don't actually go here, right? I have a completely <laughs> other school. <laughs> oh, and that was about 10 years ago now. Yeah. And since then, you've been on just a journey of different creative paths. Yeah, I guess uh, I, a compulsive hobbyist, I think I it's probably the best description of me. I wouldn't say that I get, it's not that I get bored very easily it's just that you know i yeah no i get bored very easily and so so i i i don't like to get too comfortable uh doing a job or or doing anything really so i, I try to just always put myself in the deep end of things that i don't fully understand yeah you've sort of um done something and and done it to the point that you get really good at it and then at the point that that's sort of something you can comfortably do you pick up something else that you're not comfortable with and do that until you're comfortable with it and then you pick up something else and keep going 
Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if that's a good way for one to live one's life, but <laughs> I think we'll see. Uh, it hasn't hindered me in any way. I think the more different strings to your bow that you can have, the, the stronger it is really. And I think I, from, I think, I guess the, the thing that I've been mostly focused on for a long time has been acting. And what I find is that there is, there is just nothing you can do in the world, in your life that doesn't inform your ability to act in some way because acting is just is just replicating what you see and what you experience and so the more things you see and the more things you experience the better you are on stage or in front of the camera the more things you can draw on plus yeah. i just like meeting new people and meeting new weird people that's great that's why you and me are friends <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly be, becoming an adult and and being honest with people about how we're all weird and that's why we get along is is exactly what my 15 year old self would have needed to know in advance yeah, that, yeah. because I, I was always the weird kid I don't know if you always felt like you were the weird kid um to me you were always really one know. of the cooler kids I um, think that was a perception but I think that's, uh, but everything's a perception really yeah cool no, kid definitely... cool kid me no at yes, my school you. at the school that I actually went to not the school that everyone thought I went to <laughs> The school that I actually went to, the cool the cool kids had cars at fifteen, which I did not. And I think, uh, yeah, I think the idea of a cool kid was very different. My school was quite different to yours, actually. I think I just fit in really well because your school had a lot of creatives in it. In my school, you uh, generally became a baker or an electrician or but you know like my true focused on on my, my school sorry focused on trades like that was our thing was trades and a couple of all blacks but i mean I... for all that that you weren't in a creative focused school you ended up going down a very creative path you mentioned earlier um, when we were talking that you started off planning to do a lot of photography and ended yeah. up branching out so much that you just changed the title of your page to Jordan Rivers Creative. Yeah, I think Jordan Rivers Creative was a better was a better term because uh, photography was part of it, and the main part of photography was just because where I grew up, people didn't really go very far from the town. You know, people didn't really travel very much, and I always loved catching the train into town and going to different festivals and seeing different things and going to the pride parades and going to the Africa festival. And where I grew up, none of my friends were doing those things, and they didn't even know that they existed. So photography for me was just a way of me taking photos of those things and then showing my friends how cool, you know, the rest of the city was or other cool things that they could do. And then from there, I guess, I don't know, the more festivals I went to, the more part of the art culture I became a part of, and then it evolved from there. And then I met you and then a bunch of other yeah. artists. It was great. <laughs> um, and the with the photography, you also, um, you took classes at school. Were they art classes or photography classes where you learned a lot about um, photo editing and stuff? Right. Um, yeah. Well, I, I studied darkroom photography. So originally I learned how to develop all my photos myself using all the awful, awful, ter terrible chemicals in the darkroom and whatnot. Um, and then my school sent me to a polytech to learn how to do illustration for magazines and how to edit pictures. And so I was actually sent there to do things like editing models and, you know, tummy tuck type things and how to make thighs look really nice and skin look really smooth. Um, but I didn't really like doing that. And what I found was more fun was actually just photoshopping politicians into different situations, I think. Yeah, we will come back to that thought a little bit later. <laughs> um, and that uh, that darkroom training and all that, you know, technical knowledge that you have, um, you're still putting to use today, aren't you? I am, as much as I can. Uh, there's nothing like working with like the raw materials of photography and, and getting used to touching actual film and, and taking photos without being able to review them, you know. And on a camera reel, you get 25 shots to make something good. And you just yeah. have to trust yourself in the universe that it'll work. And I think that's a good practice in general. I was just watching one of your um, videos today, one of your lockdown vlogs, um, where you were looking at the old negatives that you'd taken way back when, I think when you were in school. Uh, that's a good process too. There's nothing like having the, the kind of that grain on the film and the imperfections of, of film. I think it just, you can't replicate them now with digital stuff or with Photoshop. It's just, yeah, I love it. It's nostalgic. It's expensive, but it's it's still a good feeling. <laughs> oh, it's and it's it's such a such a skill, especially nowadays when it is easier and cheaper to obtain digital photography. 
Um, yeah. It's harder to do. <laughs> it's a lot harder yeah. to do. And I think because it's harder, it forces you to be creative and it forces you to work with less. And I think that's where the best ideas come from. Yeah. When you have just a, a completely open page where you can do anything, you find yourself falling into the same things you've been doing. Whereas when you're having the to... safe zone. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, we have to take a quick break. Uh, yep. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about your Photoshop skills, what you've done with them, <laughs> and what the reaction was. <laughs> All right. Now, back to this week's show. Welcome back, everyone. We are talking to Jordan Rivers today about all things creative and, uh, to a certain extent, all things viral. Um, not only the pandemic, but also <laughs> viral viral memes and images. Um because before the break, we were talking about your um, artistic skills and the training that you'd had and your Photoshop skills. Uh, and there was a point, was it last year or was it the year before? I think it was just over a year ago. Yeah, so last, last year-ish. Yeah. yeah, last year, uh, where you did just a quick edit um, just sort of for the sake of it. Oh, oh my God, you posted yeah. it on the internet and I was actually looking at it the other night and the tweet itself doesn't really have that many interactions as compared to the media response it provoked. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was a, <laughs> what it was, was that a... image, Jordan? <laughs> oh. Look, here's the thing. Here's the, how do I, where do I begin? Where do I begin? I'm all for practicing my skills. Okay. Let's start there. And, yeah. uh, I, I've, it's also always annoyed me that besides his politics, Donald Trump doesn't seem to do his makeup around his eyes properly. And that seems like a weird thing to get obsessed about, but it really bugs me. So he's very orange around the face and very white around the eyes and, and eyelids. And so I thought it would be interesting because I, I would assume that's his natural skin color because orange isn't that natural. I thought I would take the skin color from around his eyes and apply it to the rest of his face. And then I thought once I'd done that, maybe I would fix his hair up a little bit, make him look like he had a normal haircut. That's all I did. That is like, I didn't think anything of it. I wasn't making a political statement or anything. I just really wanted to fix this chap's makeup. And so one night, and it took me about seven minutes to do, and I was waiting for some hokey fillets in the oven. Um, I just did that and I posted it online and thought nothing of it, went to bed, woke up in the morning, and I think I had around... 11,000 views and then I started getting uh, like oh my god so many angry comments and so many <laughs> Trump Trump supporters messaging me so much weird hate mail none of it very literate and then uh, yeah by the end of two weeks I had different media companies over in America reporting on it and I had I had people sending me letters from Russia Oh my God, I had Russian newspapers and Polish newspapers messaging me in two weeks and then it had 11 million shares. Um, yeah, it went so ridiculously viral and I didn't mean for it to, <laughs> to do that. But not sorry, I think it's a very good edit. It's very convincing. It is a very good edit. To... And it looks very, very natural. I mean, I feel it's like incredibly that's... Incredibly natural. Yeah, it, you <laughs> know, it definitely think... looks like a, a plausibly real person. Um... Yeah, and I... I didn't want to make, I wasn't trying to make a political statement, which is why I chose a photo of him looking very normal. You know, I could have chosen yeah. a photo of him pulling a weird face or halfway through talking, but it's a very straight on picture. And I thought it would just be an interesting thing to edit. And then I went to bed and woke up and I committed some kind of political crime. So <laughs> I went and looked at the numbers on that, um, that Trump edit, and it has something like 44,000 um, shares by now. Yeah, that's the brilliant thing about people that hate you is that they're often your best promoters. So I, think, uh, I think that's one thing that I learned, really. Um, I find yeah, it amazing given that you never go out of your way to make anyone hate you. Oh, read the post. It, there's nothing political about it. Yeah. I'm literally, I even address my, I even address my photography teacher because it's really just trying to show her that I'm still doing photography. I was never meaning to... Uh, to get on American media shows and upset people. <laughs> My God. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the the point that I realized that um, they really kind of picked up on you was when I started seeing the news articles and, you know, Polish and Serbian and everything. 
Well, my uh, I screenshotted one because uh, I mean, like, it's all very interesting. I can't read Polish, so I hope it's nice things. I just see like Gravisi Stanley, like pretty shit Jordan Rivers creative La That's like all I'm reading. Um, <laughs> but my favorite one was the thing is that my 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 picture came out at the same time that they caught Al Chapo. And so I was sharing the front page in so many newspapers with <laughs> Al Chapo. And that is just the coolest thing that has ever happened in my life. You know, oh, like, I mean, like, he's, you know, he's not a good guy, but are you kidding me? Front page with one of the biggest drug lords of our, of our decade. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's how you know you've made it. I've made, I've made it. These big pictures of Al Chapo hiding in a hole, and then next to it is this like little Kiwi guy who <laughs> like, just like decided to edit a Photoshop image of Donald Trump while he was wearing nothing but a towel and sitting on his bed waiting for some hokey fillets to finish. Like, <laughs> oh my god, that's an is that New Zealand in a nutshell, though. Like, that's always us. I literally it's- got out of the shower, was wearing a towel, <laughs> had seven minutes for my hokey fillets to finish edited a picture that's all that happened that was that was the full intent behind that was that and image was just to wait for my hokey fillets to be nice and crispy that's it local man kills time makes front page <laughs> <laughs> my bad my bad <laughs> oh, that's how it yeah. can happen i i'm trying to remember some of the some of the comments that you got because some of them were just truly um completely off the wall um someone saying oh. you know jokes on you he's still your president not realizing oh, yeah. that you weren't american at all yeah no and so i i did reply to as many as i could because i thought they were interesting and i thought it was an opportunity to do some teaching as well because i think a lot of people were saying things that were incredibly untrue um and things that they should know about their own constitution but i mean like a lot of people re- replied with anger rather than um kind of educated responses. And so I did reply and I told people, I said, well, actually, you know, he's, he's not my president. And they were like, he won the majority vote. And I'm like, well, I mean, he didn't really as an electoral college. And then I had to teach people about the electoral college. And it just was a weird thing as a New Zealander to have to teach some of these yeah. um, <laughs> these people teach about, their own, about system. their own political yeah. system. Well, they obviously, yeah. obviously, some people don't have access to it. But um, yeah. yeah, it's popped up again this week, actually. This week, for I, some reason. I thought uh, that. It made the front page of Reddit. Yeah, it's on the front page of Reddit again. And then so <laughs> there we are. And We're so I'm not... back to getting more hate mail. The hate yeah. mail is very, it's terrible too. That's the thing is that, you know, like I write a lot of comedy, you know, and I and I do directing and acting. So I'm I'm up for heckling. I'm always up yeah. for it. Send me some good stuff. What do you got? Make fun of my hair or like my nose is kind of crooked. Send me some stuff like that. But the heckles that I got were very terrible. I, I had one lady message me saying, um, oh, you call this art? How about you go back to coloring in adult coloring in books? And so I replied, oh, she actually said, why don't you get some crayons and do an adult coloring in book? And so I replied very nicely and just let her know that, uh, thank you for the suggestion. And then I said, no, I probably wouldn't use crayons because the details are far too small and crayons are not very accurate at all. I'm more likely to use pastels. You know, I just replied to everyone very nicely. And I think that's, A, that's better for your own kind of mind and soul. And B, that makes them angrier, which is a lot funnier if you reply with kindness. I did notice that. Uh, one of your videos that you've been doing in lockdown was about uh, replying to the sort of troll comment, uh, troll oh, comments yeah. that you've got on things. And <laughs> you're just internet. endlessly patient. Um, oh, and it just makes them more and more frustrated. Tell them to have a good day as well. Or like if they if they say something horrible or abusive, let them know that you appreciate their critique and that the, that you also appreciate that they care about how well you're doing in the industry. They don't, but it's fun to pretend like you think that. Um, yeah. And it makes them very angry, which is, is great for everyone. So you get to be kind and you don't get to stoop to their level, but also you feel good because you're getting back at them. And it's a... It's a <laughs> Maybe a very childish way of dealing with it, but I think it's better for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, speaking of the the lockdown videos that you've done, um, let's talk a bit more about that because uh, in terms of the pandemic that we're all currently going through, New Zealand is um, a bit of an outlier in the uh, situation that you've had there. Yeah, I think we've, um, as of today, so New Zealand has, a, has uh, our government has implemented a four-tier system. So basically we get an alert to our phones telling us what level we're at. So there's four levels and they're all defined um, and we're all you know, reminded what they mean on TV commercials and on emails from the government themselves. 
And uh, we basically get a text message saying what level we're in. And when we know the level, then we know how to act. And so I thought for the duration of lockdown for level four, that I would try to do something every day to try and create a new routine. Because I think that's one thing that drives people mad is the loss of their average of their normal routine. And so I made a new routine and that was simply, I was gonna try and make a vlog or a video every single day. And uh, so far we're at to 32 vlogs of uh, what it's like being in lockdown. And part of that is A, I guess therapy for me, and B, trying to show other people in the world that are also in lockdown or other people who aren't. Just everybody dealing with this, that there is, um, that they're not alone and that there's different ways that they can deal with it day to day and that they should be taking it day to day. If you try to think about the whole scale of it, it's quite overwhelming. So every day I made a new vlog about a different activity that I was doing, whether it was like learning Spanish for a day or trying to learn guitar for a day, learning how to juggle. I went through different workouts that people could do in their homes, um, planning things, and then totally unrelated things as well. A couple of my friends have kids, and so a couple of the episodes are simply me reading storybooks to kids because that's another nice thing. And to me, I think adults like it as well. Adults like hearing storybooks. I mean, uh, our prime minister the other day went on TV <laughs> And she read a good night storybook to the nation, which was very nice. She read Harry McCleary. And it, it's childish, but it's there's something comforting in that, you know. And I she think really that really is the nation's mum, isn't she? Yeah, you know. And even I mean, she's had a she's become a mum while in office. Um, yeah. And I think that I don't think that's changed her as much, but I think it's probably given people confidence in her even more now as to her. Yeah as to her goals and drives behind things. Because now we, she's always talked about how she's focused on the future and making a better future for the children of the country. But now I think we're more, it's more obvious now because- Yeah, she has personal stakes in it. Yeah. And we're seeing not only that she is a good parent, but that she is a good parent while also being a good leader and that neither of those two things seems to suffer for both of them being done at the same time. Yeah. And I think especially in a time like this, sometimes you just need a mum. You need a yes. you need mum sometimes, you know. So it's quite good to have um, a, a countrywide mum that comes on TV one o'clock every day to let her know that it's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, and to read and a does, storybook every now and then. Yeah, and does Facebook live streams in her, you know, comfy stretched out sweater because she's just been putting her toddler to bed, and you know that's right. Everyone's going through the same things right now, um, and yeah. and reminding us that our leaders are people too. I feel it's quite just, jealous of you being yeah. in New Zealand well, right I, now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I I think it's a, um, the whole pandemic situation. I don't want to bring the conversation down too much, but I, yeah. I do see it as an opportunity for the world. You know, we, we have an opportunity with this. We've never had a lockdown like this, or at least for like 100 years, you know what I mean? Yeah. We haven't had a lockdown like this before. The environment hasn't had as much time before to to regenerate. You know, our ecosystem hasn't had, had as much time to just be natural for a while. And so a part of my vlog is, is about that as well. So I went and did some research into how animals around the world are reacting to having no people in those places. And it's astonishing, you know, after only after only four weeks, people are noticing, you know, people are starting to see endangered animals in, in public spaces all of a sudden. And America had so many um, instances recorded on video. So I grabbed them from YouTube of, of animals making their way into public spaces. And it's, I think that what I found as cheesy as it sounds is that I think, well, while humanity was in lockdown, I think it's a time to reflect and see that actually when we're not in lockdown, it's kind of like we're putting the animals in lockdown, you know? Yeah. So it's nice. It's, I think it's a good example. Um, I just wanted to jump in because I've been listening and I was just curious. There must be days when you don't feel like getting on and doing a daily vlog and working on things and sharing something because you you have a busy day or you're tired or your mental health creeps in or whatever it might be. How do you keep yourself motivated to do that? Because I know a lot of people out there are listening and going, gosh, I wish I could contribute something every single day too. And I know it's not possible for everyone, but do you have any tips on how you kind of continue down the path of providing for others and, and inspiring? Yeah, there were definitely days where I didn't feel like doing it. There were definitely days where I didn't feel like doing it. And for me, the point of the vlog was to be real. 
And the fact that I didn't feel like doing the vlog anymore was so real that that became what it was about. And so it's just a self-reflective practice and something that I would have been doing anyway. You know, like I would have been sitting on this couch doing nothing anyway. Let's just sit on this couch and do nothing with a camera on and I'll talk to myself for a while and whatever happens, happens and I'll upload that. And I think that's helpful enough is just being open and honest with yourself. You know, I, I don't think I ever tried to be entertaining and I, I think... You can if you want to, but I didn't want to try to be entertaining. I just wanted to show myself as a real person going through a situation that most people currently are. So I, my advice for anyone who's just not feeling like doing anything is that's fine. That's so fine. Oh, my God, that is so real and natural to not feel like doing anything. And you shouldn't feel bad about that at all. <laughs> and I think what you achieved in um, in just showing yourself just going through lockdown is um you ended up demonstrating just how much you can do in lockdown yeah especially to myself <laughs> <laughs> i mean 4900 no burpees is no small feat <laughs> yeah especially because i hate burpees oh my god they're the worst what a terrible uh, who invented that exercise the devil i am uh, <laughs> yeah a friend of mine challenged me to try and do 4900 burpees over over 28 days and so i said yes because don't really have an excuse. It's not like I'm busy. <laughs> I'm in lockdown. Did yeah, you start small and work up the number you were doing each day, or did you just just divide it by 28 and go? So what happens is this: is the, this is the terrible burpee challenge that is yet to have a name. Is you do seven days of doing 100 burpees in one go. So you do 100 burpees a day. That's awful because I couldn't do 15 prior. But you know, when you when you when you're challenged to do something, I guess you just kind of get on and do it. So you do 100 for the first week every night, then every night for the next week is 150, then the next week is 100, uh, then the next week is 200, and the week after that is 250, which was just awful, so bad, that oh my God, like felt torture. terrible. <laughs> this is very much torture, but if you do it with a friend, it becomes quite competitive, or at least I, I get quite competitive. I didn't want to be the one who didn't make it <laughs> to, yeah. to 4,900. The and competitive then streak runs deep. <laughs> Oh my God, so much. And then we got to 4,900 and I was like, you know what, this is a weird number to finish at. Should we just do another 100 and get to 5,000? And so, yeah, I'm going to do another 100 tonight just to get to 5,000. There's no real like fitness goal or anything, but I don't know. What a cool thing. I've never done that before. Blew my yeah, mind. I mean, that's, that is by itself a, a heck of an accomplishment for a lockdown. Yeah, I, the lockdown is a, yeah, it's a strange gift of time, I think depending yeah. on how you look at it. Um, I think we are going to take another quick uh, break for some ads. And uh, yeah, when we come back, we'll have more thoughts on um, art and sharing beauty and love through it. And don't All forget right. to follow Jordan, Jordan Rivers Creative on Facebook, because it is amazing. <laughs> it's inspiring. It made me laugh my face off. And that's why Cass is hosting the whole thing, because otherwise I couldn't breathe. It's true. <laughs> Brandy has no face now. It's cool. <laughs> Very bad. We'll be back soon, everybody. <laughs> now, back to this week's show. Hello again, everybody. Uh, we are talking today with Jordan Rivers, who's an old friend of mine from New Zealand, about creativity, art, photography, acting, all that good stuff. Um, Jordan, as a creative person, uh, we've found during this lockdown, it's uh, hard to make content on your own, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much. Well, I, I think it's, I think it is, I don't think it's hard, but maybe hard to make it in the way that you would normally or how you would want to. But I mean, at the moment, you know what, we all have phones, right? That's yeah. enough. If you get, if you got a, if you got a phone, that's good. Or a pen and paper, yeah. you can still make some things. It's yeah, just a bit challenging. I should say not hard, but different. Make yeah, well, I think it's, and that's what's great about it. I think that's what you were saying before about working within constraints forces you to be more creative with your elements. And I think in that you find the most amazing things, you know, in, I don't know if you ever took part, but in, in New Zealand, we have the 48 hour film festival. Did you ever take oh, part yeah. in that? I yeah, so, did, yes. Yeah, so you have, you make a group of people, you have 48 hours to make a film at the beginning of your first hour the um, the competition gives you a genre, gives you a camera angle to use, gives you a line to use, and gives you a personality trait that one of your characters has to have. They give you all four of those things, and then you have 48 hours to write, make, 
film, uh, edit and finish and hand in a film. And in, yeah. it's, it's, it's bizarre and it's crazy and it teaches actors and filmmakers to make decisions on the go and to just run and make bad decisions, good decisions, you know, to just take a bad idea and make it work. And that is, yeah. I think, where the New Zealand film industry has been able to thrive because we've all been, this is such an old competition. We've all been raised on this 48 hour film festival where we've been taught to just make things work with whatever little you have. And I'll be, some of the best New Zealand films that I have seen have come out of this 48 hours than the films that I've seen that have gotten 50 grand, you know, yeah. and that have been made over like six months. Oh, you going know? to the screenings for the 48 hour films. Um, some mm. of them are just incredible. Um, some, some of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some of them are some just... Of them are not, <laughs> some of them are not I incredible. have participated, I think I only ended up doing the 48 Hour Film Festival twice um, and came up with two incredibly different projects. One mm. was just an absolute farce with no continuity. Um, I think we were given comedy um, and... It it was ridiculous. It was more funny how ridiculous it was than anything else. Mm. Um, but the other one, uh, which was the year prior, we were given the genre of silent film, which meant that the line of dialogue we were given was the only line of dialogue we were allowed. Brilliant. And Brilliant. it turned into one of the most emotional pieces of film I've ever had the privilege to make. And you um, never would have made it otherwise. You never would have yeah, thought to have made that otherwise. Those constraints are brilliant have, for us. Yeah, I would never on my own have come up with the idea to make a film with only one line of dialogue. Um, and by nature of the competition and the fact that they're giving everyone the same dialogue, um, a, a piece of dialogue that has no meaningful content in it. I, I think you're I, right. I we, think... we really do make uh, better things when we're constrained. Yeah, I think artists thrive under constraints. I, mean, I think some of the most beautiful things have come out of horrible times and um, or, or dire situations. I think some of the most beautiful yeah. stories and the most beautiful things that we've created in the art industry have come from that. So, no, big, big fan of that. And I think the lockdown is just another version of that. In fact, we actually still had the 48-hour film festival this year during lockdown. But oh, it was wow. completely free. I think we had almost 2,000 entries, 1,500 entries, I think. And everyone just had to make a film. They got given their genre. They got given, you know, uh, you know, all the different things I usually get. But they had to make it from home in isolation. And so that's going to be amazing to, to see what people come up with. And it evens out the playing field as well. Because often every year you have, like, wetter workshops. They have a team, oh. for God's sakes. It's like There's that always never someone seems, who has never just fair. way too much money to put into it. <laughs> Yeah, it was a wet of workshops. You guys made Lord of the Rings. You guys shouldn't be able to enter this. But they, you know, they do. And we're all very, you know, kind spirited yeah. about it. But uh, and but, but also, this year everyone had to make it from win. home. I'll be honest. It's... I'll be honest. This is going to air. They've never won. They've never <laughs> 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 Where to work they never won. Because I, I don't know. I think it's um they make amazing things, but I think being amazing isn't what gets you because it's audience vote. You know, and I think being just yeah. amazing and technically great doesn't exactly win the competition. There's also, Usually it's some there's also something about the New Zealand um, culture and, and the perspective of um, number eight wire that we yeah. appreciate more the things that are done on a shoestring with nothing but just complete ingenuity than something. Yeah. You know, we're, we've always sort of rooted for the underdog in that sense. And, and you see it in, in the way we respond to Hollywood movies, which for us in New Zealand are very much like imported culture mm. versus something like um, Eagle versus Shark, which yeah, is... That is my favourite film. And if anyone, you know, is wondering and listening to this, Eagle versus Shark is my favourite New Zealand film of all time. And is my favorite Taika Waititi film. And I think it's his first. No, it's his second ever film that he's ever made. So if you like Taika Waititi and, and Thor Ragnarok and everything else that he does, I highly recommend you go back and watch his humble beginnings of um, mm. Eagle versus Shark, which is just a, an amazing, low-key, romantic comedy that is 
really not romantic and is in no way trying to be a comedy, but just is by way of being. It's great. Yeah. And it also, also it's Jermaine Clement as well. Jermaine Clement. I mean, that was my I had forgotten that that was a Taika Waititi film. I remembered Jermaine Clement because he's just so iconic in that. He's great. Um, they filmed it out the back of my house. That's the main reason I knew about really? it. It's because it's filmed ah. up behind my old house when I was growing up as a kid. And so that was my first instance of film was actually um, riding my bike down to the dairy. Do you guys have dairies over there? What are they called there? Uh, convenience, convenience schools? Store. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Riding my bike down to the convenience store where they were filming behind it um, with my friends and sitting on my bike watching Jermaine Clement and Lauren Horsley and Taika Waititi make this film with a crew of like five people, you know, and that was that was my first experience of film and I just thought it was the stupidest thing ever. And then, and then I'm now I'm part of it. Like, yeah, you're world famous in New Zealand as that guy from that thing. Oh so yeah, no, I definitely am. Can I tell out. you? I tell you. I tell you a story, quickly, of how I know where I am in the industry. I did. It, I've done a, a bunch of commercials and a bunch of short films and whatnot. And every now and then, people recognise me. But the guy, at the fish and chip store, recognised me one time. This is a few years ago, and he goes, "Oh, you're the guy from that thing." And I was like, "Yeah, I am. I am." And he goes, um, oh, would you like a free hot dog with your chips? And I was like, oh, you know, this is amazing. Cool, we're getting free stuff as an actor. <laughs> free hot dog, amazing. And I said, um, and I said, actually, you know, I don't really eat hot dogs, but could I have a free, you know, a free fish instead? And uh, the guy said, oh, you're not that famous. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. All right, wicked. So that's where I am. So at the moment in the industry in New Zealand, I am free hot dog famous. Um, <laughs> but the goal, the goal is to be free fish. That's uh, but, yeah. yeah. That's where I am. That's, that's, that's like a YTP level of famous. You're not quite there yet. I'm not there yet, but I'll have. I can have a hot dog, deep fried yeah. hot dog. Yeah, deep fried fish. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> who, do you, who do you think you are, bloody Taika Waititi? Only he gets free fish around here. <laughs> hell, uh, <laughs> I always thought it was funny too that they'll like see like. Jay Z, for example, would be like, "Hey, bro, I have a free hamburger." He's not the one that needs the free hamburger. Like, it just I oh, get yes. it for promotion, but it makes me laugh at how the world is so backwards sometimes. Oh, like, when I when I was a rock climbing instructor, we had Jimmy Carr, the English comedian, come along. I love him, and uh, I didn't know it was him for ages. It was just so, but he also he also still talks the exact same in real life. By the way, he's very strange. But him yeah. and his girlfriend at the time came along, and they wanted to go rock climbing, and so. I went and spoke to my manager once I figured out who he was. And I was like, should we give Jimmy Carr some free rock climbing? And my manager was like, get out of here, mate. He's got so much money. We should charge him extra. And I was like, all right. So that's where we are. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I just naturally assumed we're supposed to give rich people free stuff. But that is a weird misconception. Why would we do that? It is. Yeah. Rich people, they should be paying full price. Well, Incidentally, we, we told him the price and he didn't pay and then he left. He didn't want to do it. <laughs> So. <laughs> well, he got into hot water too for scamming on his taxes. Did you hear about Which that? Makes so much sense now. <laughs> I was like, that motherfucker didn't even want to pay for rock climbing. Fourteen dollars, fourteen dollars for an hour of rock climbing. Get out of here! Come on, what? And, and, you have to and save I, up, Jimmy. Yeah, oh, and like not just rock climbing, but rock climbing at Fergs, which is like good rock climbing. Good rock like, on, mate. Rock on the harbour, bike riding. I also ran skate lessons. If you wanted to learn how to roller skate, I could have taught him. Twenty dollars. <laughs> oh gosh, you could have done so much more for him, but but he turned it all down for fourteen dollars. Yep, and then he got arrested for tax evasion. That's his fault. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Henry Henry Cavill paid full price. Just to let you know, I'm going to just spill the beans on all these superstars that came rock climbing. <laughs> Henry, Henry Cavill, he, he played never full. Never got dinged for tax price. fraud, did he? Yeah, no. Anna Paquin, she paid. She paid full price, and she's a Kiwi. She, you know, we would have yeah. just given her mates' rates, but she still paid full price. Just letting you know. <laughs> oh, who's that guy from? Um, who's the guy from Baby Baby Driver? Oh, That's Ansel what? Elgort. Yeah, what a funny name. Yeah, he came. He came rock climbing. He paid full did price. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You almost could do a, like a whole episode on he paid full price. <laughs> it's a guessing game though. I'm going to show the audience a picture and you guess if he paid full price or not. <laughs> Seriously, that was brilliant. Even this. the way your voice sounded at the end, you paid full price. was great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I definitely met far more famous people rock climbing than I have 
in the acting industry. <laughs> it's a good gig. You want to get into acting? You should be a rock climbing instructor. That's how you get in. That's the in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no, yeah, but yeah, the, those constraints. I think <laughs> you know. Get back to that. I think that is lockdown is a is is a constraint for creatives, but I also think it's an it's an arena where we can thrive. I think yeah. it's a great time. There's a lot of freedom in in everything being so constrained. And also I as a creative in the film industry, it means that the film industry has slowed down, which means that I think for some people it means you can catch up now. You can spend time now at home, go over some monologues, you know, watch some Shakespeare films, watch some really horrible, terrible romantic comedies and and just watch how they move, watch how they work. Go back and watch. I highly I recommend anyone going and watching the um Hollywood the Hollywood Actors Roundtable sessions. They do actors roundtable sessions and they do um they do directors roundtable sessions. And they're amazing because you're just listening to just listening and watching the best of the best have a conversation about their art. And what you find is that it's the same at every level. I mean, like, it's amazing for me as an actor to see that Hugh Jackman is dealing with the same problems before going on set that I'm dealing with. Or it's amazing to see that Al Pacino and Robert De Niro are dealing with the same, you know, directorial situations that I'm dealing with in my, you know, in my house directing my short film in 48 hours. It's amazingly reassuring to know that it's it's the same at every level all the way to the top that the way we make art doesn't need to change at its fundamental level, that we, you know, get access to more people and better equipment and all of that, more money, whatever, bigger audience. But the the core of what we do doesn't need to change. No, it's, yeah. Dave Grohl nailed this with that last, uh, with the second to last album that Dave Grohl did for the Foo Fighters, and he nailed it by saying, because they went and re-recorded that on cassette because they wanted to prove that all of the technology that we've come up with doesn't change music. And it's the same with acting. And his point that he wanted to make that the most important part of the of art is the is just the human component. That's it. So if you've got you in confinement, if you've got you in isolation, that's enough. You, you've got everything you need. You just need you to make art and to create things. Good old Dave Grohl. I love that man. Oh. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You and Dave Grohl both. <laughs> um, the the last thing I want to touch on in the, in the last few minutes we have, um, one of the lines that I um, particularly noticed in your uh, Facebook bio is that you're exploring the world and learning more about the world and spreading love and compassion through it, um, which I think is is a hugely important thing and also kind of an unusual thing um, in terms of the core beliefs about ourselves that we express. I think that's just, I, I was raised, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm terribly religious, but I was raised as a Baha'i. And uh, Baha'is are generally, not even just generally, just very accepting of different ways of life. And it's very much encouraged that you immerse yourself in different cultures and other people's religions and whatnot. And so I was raised on that being a core cool way to improve oneself is is immersing yourself in other people's cultures and ways. And I think I've seen nothing but positive things come from that. And not in just a religious sense, but just in a in a in a mental sense. And uh, you know, for my own mental health, that's been great. Learning about other people's struggles and other people's things. And so, you know, that was the beginning of the page. Like I said, it was about showing people my photography to show them the different events that they could go to. And it was just about trying to get people to experience kind of the really beautiful, small details of the world, because there are just so many brilliant and beautiful things out there that I don't think we allow ourselves to be open to or to see. So, and art is just the best way to do that because you don't need to know the same language. You know, I mean, I, I can, there are so many Italian paintings that we all study in school, but none of us speak Italian, you know? Um, Brandy, did you have anything to add? Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone went and followed this man because he's brilliant. Um, Jordan Nerve is creative on Facebook and there's uh, his website and everything. All the information is on there because he's got so much great content. It's inspiring. It's funny. It's awesome. Jordan, I have one question that I ask every guest before the end of the show. Oh, no. Um, if you had 15 Bernie. seconds. I know. I know. <laughs> I vote Bernie. Is that what you're going to ask me? I vote Bernie. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
undercover. No, if you had 15 <laughs> seconds because the whole world had to sit down, shut up, and listen to one message that you wanted to share, what would it be? Um, you are enough. You've always been enough. And as long as you love yourself, that's the best thing you can do for the world. Thank you very much, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure. And Cass, you are a rock star as always. Thank you for joining us on Team Wealth Radio. Same time, same Thank place. Thank you for having Next me. Week, everyone. Thanks, guys, so much. Thank you.